Well, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for coming. And it's exciting to be here. So we've been talking over the last uh, half hour or so about the different ways that coffee can impact us as individuals, quality, um, the, the, the market, I guess, in terms of the, the cuppings and coffee as wine, um, and also the communities. Um, so now we're going to look a bit more broadly and think even about how coffee affects the environment. Um, so I think a really good place to start is with this map here. And so what you'll notice is that the yellow areas, which indicate coffee growing regions, these overlap to a really large degree with some of the hot spots of biodiversity on our planet. Those hot spots are shown in orange. So just from that alone, you know, I think we can begin to understand that the extent to which we can be good environmental stewards of coffee can have really tremendous impacts on the biodiversity of our planet. Um, but this, there's good news because coffee can be grown in a very environmentally sensitive way. Um, traditionally, coffee was grown as an understory crop. So you can see it here and some other folks have shown pictures as well. And so when you look at these pictures, it looks like forest, right? It looks like forest. So it's not really a big surprise then that these shade coffee stands would be able to support quite a lot of biodiversity. Um, and that is what we see. We see remarkable diversity in terms of plants, um, epiphytes, orchids, um, in terms of the, the amphibians, <laughs> insects, especially, of course, being from the lab of Vaux, the birds, right? So these pictures are just a few of the hundreds of different tropical resident species that use shade coffee farms. Um, and it's so cool when you're in these farms, you know, it'll be quiet and all of a sudden you'll hear little chips in the canopy and this huge group or flock of birds comes, you know, passing overhead. Um, and oftentimes, along with these resident birds, what we see are a lot of kind of our birds, right? These migratory birds that breed up here in the summer, and then they spend the winter down in Central and South America. And many of these migrants are very, very abundant in these shade coffee farms. And in fact, in some of the research that we've done, my students and I, and as well as others, has shown that if you look at these landscapes as a whole, you usually will find the greatest abundances of these neotropical migrants in the shade coffee stands. Um, and it isn't that they're just occurring there, right? Because we always have to worry if we're just seeing certain animals somewhere. Maybe they're thriving, maybe not. But the good news is, for a lot of these migrants, they do seem to be thriving. Um, we've done studies in Venezuela and Colombia looking at migratory birds, um, like this cerulean warbler shown here. Um, and this is a bird that's a um, very, there's a lot of conservation attention focusing on it. It's declining tremendously. And so when we study cerulean warblers, we ban them, we recite them, you know, measure how much they weigh. We find that they're actually gaining mass over the winter season. So that's really important because they need that mass in order to migrate successfully back up here to breathe. Um, and they're surviving the winter. And they're returning year after year to the same coffee farm. So it's really cool, because we actually had one female that came back five years in a row, these little tiny birds, five years in a row to the same spot and the same farm. And it was, you know, so, so I think they become sort of attached to these coffee farms as well. Um, but the bad news is that we're seeing a lot of conversion of coffee, of shade coffee, both to sun coffee, as we show here, but also to other types of land use, like pasture. Um, but if we focus on just coffee as a whole, like if you look at these pictures of sun coffee, you can see it's grown like corn as a monoculture. And it only takes a quick look to notice that, hmm, you know, it's not really going to support or provide ha habitat or provide as many resources to animals that need forest <coughs> habitat. Um, so there are other consequences, though, if we think more about the environment and the way that we as humans are interacting with the environment in these communities. Because shade coffee, another advantage is that, um, as was mentioned earlier, many times the growers are planting other crops. Um, so they're, they're growing 
food and fiber that they can use, or even alternatives to market. Um, so that center picture, like, don't you just wish, like, the chocolate came out? Like, I would so be in that business. So, um, you know, but this is important. It actually really does affect the nutritional um, status of a lot of growers. Um, we can also think about coffee, shade coffee, just in terms of keeping trees on these steep forested slopes. That's important. I think about climate change, carbon offsets. You know, that, that is um, critical. And coffee, um, the shade coffee, those trees, also by keeping those steep slopes forested, that helps to prevent landslides. We know there's research that shows that deforestation promotes landslides, which are devastating to communities. Sometimes they're wiped right down the mountainside. Um, but they also can impair water quality. Um, they can you know, reduce the soil quality due to erosion. Um, but I do think birds have this sort of special place in really helping us to communicate the importance of shade coffee because they're very loved. You know, they're pretty easy to see. They're sensitive to environmental change. Um, and they're also, they can even be important in terms of the, the economy because they can attract ecotourists. You know, these bird farms, you know, can be really popular. So this is, um, this picture here, it's really cool. These were, um, so this was at Seni Cafe, which is the science arm of the Federation of Coffee Growers. And they have these outreach programs where these kids made these little models of every bird they've seen in their coffee <coughs> um, farm. So really touching. And from that bird frame of viewing coffee and sort of the environmental sensitivity of coffee practices, um, viewing it through this bird lens, we also see some of these certification standards are, that are out there. And so two of the ones that really have the environment and bird habitat are the bird-friendly coffees and also the Rainforest Alliance, if you've seen any of those. Um, and certification is one way that we as consumers can make a choice or a statement about what's important to us, what we value, and helping to support those growers. Um, but it's really only one part of the solution. Um, and that's partly what our research you know, down in, in Kalka is looking at as well, because it's not accessible necessarily to all farmers, but it is one way that U.S. consumers can really make a statement. And so, you know, with that, I think we only have a brief amount of time this evening, um, and it's a really complex issue, like anything, right? There are a lot of different trade-offs, but I hope this lets you at least start getting a sense of the different ways that coffee can impact the environment as well as these other um, 